Ah, right. So um, this talk is basically just a short story about going from uh, not much but an idea of a pro uh, for a particular project to do something to bring up uh, a RISC-V core and tool chain using open source components in the RISC-V ecosystem. Um, there's a project background of things that I could talk about, but I'm not going to talk about. Um, mainly, I'm going to focus on uh, the experience with using these components from the RISC-V ecosystem and some observations about that uh, along the way. So that basically consisted of doing a survey of RISC-V cores, um, bringing up a software tool chain from the existing open source components, simulation and testing of those cores, bench and then benchmarking them. Um, in conclusion, I would say that the project's been a success in that we were able to get what we needed from the ecosystem with relatively little effort and carry on working with, with what we found. Just before I do get started, um, a quick introduction to Embicosm. Uh, so I'm a, a compiler engineer at Embicosm. I work it on um, mainly on GNU toolchains, so GCC and that kind of thing. Um, Embicosm is a, a compiler toolchain consultancy. We do a lot of work with GCC and with LLVM. We're members of the RISC V Foundation. So, um, what were we looking for in a RISC V core? Um, basically, without going into too much depth about all of them, we wanted to uh, have a, an RV32 system with bare metal, no operating system, no hosted environment. We wanted a core that's easily extensible so that we can add new instructions and try them out or otherwise try um, making modifications to the core, seeing how that affects what we want to do. Um, we wanted a core that's relatively small so it doesn't take up too much space, isn't too big and complex to modify. Also, um, we care about performance, so something that's relatively fast and open source is helpful because it means that it's easy to have a look at the core and evaluate it. Um, so there's quite a lot of open source RISC-V cores out there now. Um, there's no point in talking about them all, but at least 20 are easy to find. Um, so the three that were actually interesting uh, in terms of the requirements that we had were Clifford Wolf's Pico RV32, the RISC-V core from the Pulp project, and uh, the rocket chip generator to some extent. So um, Pico RV32 pretty much fits all of those requirements that we had. So um, there's no need to discuss it too much uh, in detail. Um, the risky core from the port platform, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, um, met most of those requirements as well. Um, I think it's relatively small. I realize I haven't really given a, a concrete def definition of what small is, but it seems small enough. Um, is it relatively fast? So at the time we were doing the survey, we knew that it had run about 50 or 75 megahertz um, or it had been run at that speed on a, a Zilink Zinc. Um, I believe it can go faster than that. Um, I'm not entirely sure how fast it can go, but it's fast enough for our purposes. It's open source <coughs> as well. Um, the rocket chip generator, we thought we'd better have a look at because it's, in some way, it kind of looks like the canonical RISC-V implementation is, is where lots of resources would point to, something that a lot of people are looking at or interested in. So um, it kind of meets some of the requirements that in that you can generate an RV32 core or SOC or whatever. Um, whether, it, whether or not it's easily extensible, some people I think would say yes. From my point of view, it's not that easily extensible because I don't know Scala or Chisel and there's kind of, there kind of be a bit of a learning curve um, for doing that. I can see a few people nodding, so <laughs> um, I guess it must be a little <coughs> bit difficult. Um, does it generate something that's relatively small? I, um, I don't know. I spent a bit of time trying to generate different cores from it. Sometimes when I was generating things, I'd get errors out of the tool chain that confused me, so I, don't, I didn't really come to a conclusion about exactly what you could generate with it. Um, uh, It is open source. Um, but what we decided to do was just go forward with the Risky and Pico RV32 cores because it would probably be too difficult for um, using the rocket chip generator for this project. So um, once we've got a core, uh, we need a tool chain as well. So we wanted to use the GNU tool chain because that's complete. All of the LLVM ports shaping up very nicely. It's not ready to use yet. Um, so basically, we need, um, took the existing repositories um, so binutils, uh, GCC, 
um, were upstream at the time. Uh, Newlib is now upstream, but wasn't at the time. Um, and GDB is not yet upstream. Um, we've done a little bit of customization on each of them. Um, so we've basically just taken forks that we're maintaining of each of those repositories. Um, we don't really want to deviate too much from the entire, um, sorry, the, deviate too much from the upstream tool chain. Any changes that we make that are valuable, we'd hope to submit back upstream, particularly for GDB, which um, has got a couple of patches in, in it that we've um, uh, added to make it a bit more usable at the moment, especially for bare metal. Um, so the other repositories that make up our um, stack of uh, models and um, tool chain are the Pico RV32 repository, which we thought just to add uh, a Verilator model and then a short, a small test bench for that model to convince ourselves that um, the Verilator model was working as we'd expect. Did the same thing for Risky, so um, add a Verilator model to that and a, a test bench. And then we wrote a GDB server that links into those Verilator models so that we could uh, instantiate the models and then control them with GDB, load programs on them, run things and inspect the state as you would normally with GDB. Um, so what, what have we actually done to customize the tool chain? Not, um, we've not had to do very much. Um, I have heard it said that the RISC-V tool chain um, hasn't had that much attention paid to bare metal support, but it doesn't seem like there's too much of a problem with using it for bare metal. You just need to change a few things. Uh, in particular, in newlib, um, underscore the, un the start function, um, I think at the moment it assumes a hosted environment, so either running on Linux or the, maybe the proxy kernel um, that you might launch, um, say with Spike. Um, all we really need to do is set the stack point to something. Our first attempt, um, we assumed that 4 byte alignment would be enough. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. Um, it needs to be 16 byte aligned. Um, I think there is some debate about exactly what the stack alignment should be for um, RV32 at the moment on the mailing list. Um, if, if you do have a misaligned stack pointer, nearly everything does work, just a, a relatively small proportion of the GCC test suite failed um, when we didn't have it aligned to 16 bytes. Um, for IO, because these, because these verilated models of the cores have got no connection to the outside world, um, we use the GDB server to implement hosted I.O. within GDB um, so that we can do things like printf and um, communicate with the program running on the core. Um, syscalls are implemented in the GDB server as well, which is partly how the hosted I.O. works. Um, the risky core um, al has also got some support for interrupts so um, that required us to add an interrupt vector table, um, but that was a relatively minor change as well. Um, some other observations. Um, when we're building software for, the, for, these, for these models, we've still been linking in libgloss. Uh, again, I've seen a, a big debate on the mailing list about whether the tool chain should do that or not. For us, it seems to be OK. Um, the name of the tool chain has only been a very minor issue. Um, again, that's something that people seem to talk about a lot. Um, I, I suppose it would be more convenient if it were just RISB instead of RISB32 or 64, given that the compiler is the same for both of them. Um, having the uh, word unknown in the compiler name um, is OK as well. Sometimes it can be a bit worrying for a customer if you deliver a compiler to them that's got unknown in the name. But, um, it, but it doesn't technically cause a problem. Um, Verilating Pico RV32 is pretty straightforward. Um, we didn't really have any issues in, in doing that. Um, one thing we did find is that the risky core always starts executing at the boot address. So what, do, what I mean by that is that um, the risky core has got a debug unit, and you can use that debug unit to set the next program counter. If uh, you want to boot it up and start executing at some address that's not the boot address, then if you set the program counter before you've... Um, Before you've, before you've enabled fetch, then it ignores that, um, it ignores you setting the program counter. If you start it fetching uh, first and then try to set the program counter, it's too late, you've already fetched an instruction. Um, so it's going to execute the instruction at the boot address. 
Um, so to get around that, um, we modified the tool chain to make sure that the entry point of programs was the, was the boot address. Um, the other issue we had with it, which was only a minor issue, is that not all of the system Verilog that's used in uh, Risky is supported by Verilator, but it was stuff that wasn't really critical, so we could just comment those bits out uh, or change them in some other way. Um, also, hooking up a, a me memory to the to Risky um, involved a bit of trial and error. There is some documentation for it, but um, for, mi for handling misaligned uh, accesses, uh, it took a bit of just experimentation to see exactly what the load store unit was doing. So, for um, we've got a tool chain, we've got related models of the cores, um, we want to test them out. So there's, there's various things we could use. One thing is the RISC-V Visor test suite. Um, I think at the minute um, that's a little bit basic, so it's possible to pass all the tests in the ISA test suite, but still have some errors in your core, um, things that it doesn't do quite right. So the other form of testing that we used was the GCC test suite. So GCC's test suite has got about 87,000 tests in it, and thousands of those also get executed on the target. The idea being that you're checking that GCC generates code that executes correctly, but kind of implicitly there there's an expectation that the core is going to be executing the generated code correctly as well. So in a way, you can use it to um, test the hardware implementation as well. Um, if you do run the GCC test suite with these cores, what do you get? So with Pico RV32, um, the two main things to look at are the unexpected failures and the unresolved test cases. So all those 530 unexpected failures here this isn't because of a problem with Pico RV32, but instead um, we never got around to implementing hosted I.O. in the GDB server for Pico RV32. So those failing tests are just because of the uh, gap in the implementation in our GDB server. The rest is okay. Um, the unresolved test cases are ones where the execution of them took too long and the test suite killed them. The reason is the timeout that I was using here was relatively short, so and a cycle accurate model is pretty slow. So 124 of those test cases just got killed. But if you turn off the timeout, then the test cases start to pass again. Um, with, with the GCC test suite on Risky, um, there are still 27 unexpected failures. Um, all of those failures, aren't, again, aren't particular issues, but instead it's a mix of it's a mix of reasons. So one is um, we re removed support for constructors and destructors from, from the library to try and make the size of binaries just a little bit smaller. But the constructor and destructor tests, or the ones that rely on having a constructor and destructor, are still running. So we need to either skip them or put back support for constructors and destructors. One of the tests uses more RAM than our model had. Um, some of them use libunwind uh, to... Some of, the, uh, some of the tests are of using libunwind with some of the dwarf information, which is something that um, isn't actually not supported on in the setup we've got anyway, so they, they need to be sort of um, skipped as well. Some of the tests rely on a host environment, which we don't have. We're on, we've got a bare metal environment instead. Um, and then I think three or four of those test, test, test failures would, would fail um, on, on Spike at the time we took a snapshot of the, of the tool chain. Uh, the unresolved test cases, again, it's just that the timeout's too short. Those go away if you turn up the timeout and wait long enough. Um, so having convinced ourselves that both those cores actually um, work correctly, as, as far as we can determine, um, we wanted to look a little bit at the performance of the cores as well. So um, we think uh, a good way to do that is to use the Beebs or Bristol and Embed... Uh, sorry, Bristol and Embicosm Embedded Benchmark Suite, which is a set of 81 benchmarks. They're, they're not ones that we've come up with ourselves, but they've all been selected from the worst case execution time uh, suite, uh, MyBench and DSP Stone. Um, the, those, the, point, the original point of those benchmarks was to show the energy consumption of embedded devices. Um, so it's already set up for building for things like ARM and AVR. Um, the, the suite was developed as part of the Machine Guided Energy Efficient Compilation Project. Um, but because, so because all these benchmarks are quite small and they don't need any I.O., they're quite good for, for us to evaluate these cores as well. 
Um, you get around the fact that, uh, of needing I.O. because there's a start trigger and a stop trigger function in the benchmark. So just before the benchmark runs, it calls start trigger. Um, when it ends, it calls stop trigger. If those functions aren't implemented, you provide an implementation that so in some way signals um, to whatever you're using to time things that they've just, that they've just been called. So in this case, um, we use breakpoints in GDB to detect when start and stop are called. And then we can just get the cycle count that way from the model. Um, I run all of those I've run all of those benchmarks um, on both cores. Um, ten of them um, I've thrown away the results for, either because they take so long to run, um, I didn't want to wait that long. One or two have got issues with the self-checking mechanism in Beebs. So the self-check mechanism in Beebs just compares the result of the benchmark that's been computed with an expected result. Some of the those expected results have been generated on machines where values have overflowed or have some slightly different property to risk 5 which means the result's different. So where there is a self-check issue, both Pico RV32 and RISC is showed that, um, showed up as, as having not uh, computed a different result to the expected one. I think this is a difference between RISC 5 and the other platforms that the benchmark suite's been tested on. Um, so those are the 10 that we dropped. Uh, from the results. Um, I have got a file that accompanies this presentation which contains all the cycle counts for all the benchmarks on both cores. Um, what I just want to look at here is the ratio of cycle counts between Pico RV32 and RISCI. So um, this is that ratio for all of the benchmarks. Um, obviously you can't read this graph here now, but what I would draw attention to is the fact that in general, Pico RV32 takes about four times more cycles um, to execute a benchmark than the risky core did. Um, the rightmost two columns are the average and the geometric mean. They're very close to four. Um, so in conclusion, um, to continue the project, we've decided to move forward with the risky core. Um, we were able to make that decision by being able to get off a cycle accurate models and tool chain using existing components from the RISC-5 ecosystem. Um, without too much effort, it's, the ecosystem's very healthy. It provided, provided a lot for us, saved us having to do too much work. Um, if you want to replicate any of these results or build the models and the tool chain and use cycle accurate models of Pico RV32 or RISCI, then um, there's a link on the slides, uh, the slides are posted on Twitter, which links to a readme for doing that. So that will, if I can, um, uh, I'll, I just want to switch tab. All oh, right, okay. Oh, right, okay. And then, is it F11? No. Oh, sorry, can you help me? All oh, right, okay. Brilliant. So um, there's a readme in that repository. It's just got a quick start set of commands. You'll be able to build the tools and the models. Uh, you can run the Beebs benchmarks and get all those results out. You can run the GCC test suite. And then there's a quick introduction to building a Hello World uh, program and then running it on a cycle accurate model through GDB. Um, so, oh yeah, that's turned off. Um, it's not complicated, just some commands that you can copy and paste. So if you have a go at it and you have any problems with it, give me a shout. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah, the final thing is that MBCOSM is hiring. Um, if you're in this room, you should come and work with us. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs>